go. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Georgetown. It is a joy to be with you this morning. My name is Alan. I have the joy of being one of the pastors here, and we're thankful that you're here. If you're joining us online, we say hello to you. Friends, today is our third and final uh, week where we look at Do Unto Others, our campaign for kindness. What is it that you and I can do to help build some bridges in our community um, among, among all of the division and all of the strife that we have in this difficult political season? Let's pray. God, we pray for uh, our hearts and our minds to be opened. We pray to be able to hear guidance from you, to know when to turn to you when we're being led in other ways, ways to make us look suspiciously at our neighbors. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I did a little bit of history research this week, and Adam Hamilton introduced an idea that I want to begin with today, and it has to do with the Civil War. In 1861, the Civil War began just moments after President Abraham Lincoln had been inaugurated as president. Over that four-year span, the Civil War was the bloodiest conflict our country's ever been in. 620,000 Americans lost their life. 620,000 in that day was about 2% of the total population of the country. That number would be more than those that would lose their life in World War I and World War II combined. Four years had gone by, and Abraham Lincoln was again elected president of the, the, the Union of the United States, and he rose to give his second inaugural address. He spoke at a time that was just about a month away from the end of the Civil War. He rose and spoke about 41 days before he would be assassinated. Those from the North were listening what punishment would they serve? What retribution would happen because of what we have been through in the last four years? We are literally divided, and we're fighting, and we're killing each other. Tell us what we're going to do. And Abraham Lincoln rose, and he spoke what has been called kind of his second most famous speech. It was very brief, it wasn't nearly as long as his first inaugural address. He addressed slavery. He called it out for what it was. He, he didn't leave that part out. He said one-eighth of the whole population were slaves. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. But then Abraham Lincoln led us. And he led us to come back together, and he led us in unity. He began by naming the things that both sides held dear. He said in this brief address, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. And at a time when Abraham Lincoln could have said, anything because he probably was given the right to say just about anything, all that they had been through. He ends his brief address with this paragraph that I want us to look at today. This was a decision that he made, a decision to call for healing and to call for unity. With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and within all nations." Part of that, if you're familiar, would become the motto for the VA, the call to help those 
who have borne the battle uh, for their widow and for their orphan. And over the next five years, these 11 southern states that had left would rejoin the Union. In 1870, in March of 1870, Texas rejoined the Union. And I would be curious to wonder if this moment when Abraham Lincoln decided to call for unity and to call us to heal made the difference in bringing those states back and bringing back the United States of America. I think it's appropriate to end with our scripture today uh, of 1 Corinthians when we're looking at doing unto others and a campaign for kindness. The first week, we kind of circled the word humility, uh, that to enter into these conversations, to enter into a time of, of healing and bridge building, it's going to take a lot of humility for us to say that we have been wrong, to say that we're listening and we're interested in what and respect what you might say. Um, we also talked about understanding last week. We have to be able to understand each other. Where have we come from? What are our backgrounds? What are our histories? What has led us to the beliefs that we hold up today? And then today, as we look to do unto others as they would have to do to us, we look at kindness. And friends, a call to kindness doesn't ask who you voted for in the last election. It's something that we offer to everyone. So 1 Corinthians 13, as you heard it read this morning, I would imagine you, you thought about that wedding that you've attended. Now, this is a scripture that we hear at most all weddings. I stood right here on Thursday afternoon and read that scripture in a wedding. It is one that is very worthy of a wedding. However, the context of where that scripture comes from was not a time of a beginning of a relationship. It wasn't uh, two people looking lovingly into their eyes and Paul offers this idea of love. Corinth was an incredibly divided community. Corinth was a place where they were going out. You remember at the beginning of, of 1 Corinthians, you have these lines about, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I Apollo, I follow Apollos, they're divided, and Paul is trying to bring them back together, trying to unite them. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, he says, I appeal to you that all of you agree together so that there may be no divisions among you, that you may be united in mind and conviction. Friends, 1 Corinthians 13 is not a wedding scripture. In fact, some would say it's actually more appropriate to read this scripture as someone's going through a divorce or considering a divorce than it would be at the beginning of a wedding, beginning of a marriage. And so we see where we are today, and maybe this is a time for us to read this again. We've been through years of fighting and years of strife, and we've been through COVID, and we've been through demonstrations around George Floyd. We've been through an attack on our capital, and we're also divided. Just as Lincoln called the country back together again, 1 Corinthians 13 is a call to what can unite us again, and that call is to love. So taking us out of the context of a beautiful wedding ceremony where the scripture is certainly appropriate and a beautiful thing, what if the context instead was a community that's divided and a community that's being called back together, a community that's been through so much pain and strife and they're looking at each other with suspicious eyes. Love is patient, and love is kind. And love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things and believes in all things, hopes all things, and it endures 
all things, and love never ends. Commentator Brian Peterson says that Paul in this uh, uh, chapter is not talking about a love that's measured in feelings. You know, sometimes we definitely find something just we love and we just feel this feeling of love, this feeling of, of care. Um, but in the context of where it's coming from in Corinth and the word that Paul is trying to bring to Corinth, 1 Corinthians isn't about this wonderful feeling of love. It's actually about our capacity for tension and debate and disagreement without division and without separation. Love is how much good, hard debate and disagreements can you go through and yet stay together. Paul's saying that is a definition of love. So how can we do this? I think it starts, as 1 Corinthians suggests, of seeing each other as part of the body. Seeing each other together, seeing each other as one. In 1 Corinthians 12, the 12th chapter has to be read before the 13th chapter. And in there, Paul says, God has so arranged the body giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Part of the answer of how we can get down this road together is actually being uh, researched right now. One of our members who occasionally sends me wonderful uh, ideas from time to time, she's a professor of uh, communication studies. She shared me this week, she said, hey, the things you're talking about, we're actually studying that in, in, the, in the university right now. And what they're finding has to do with what we went through with COVID and all of these divisions. But what they're finding is that the more of a shared identity you feel with someone else, the more you're willing to accommodate your language and accommodate For them. The more you feel a shared identity, the more you feel like they're actually one of us, kind of we're all together. There's things that we both want in this. The more we can respect, the more we can listen with those that we disagree. It's Abraham Lincoln saying, We've killed each other for four years, but we both pray to the same God. It's similar to saying that both Republicans and Democrats want their children to graduate and succeed. It'd be similar of saying, hey, we shop at the same grocery stores. What is it that we hold in common and what can we lift up and bring together? I think we would find that there's a whole lot more that we hold in common than what separates us. And so our message is love. Our message is kindness. And we call out messages that separate and that divide us. We call out messages that say they are trying to destroy us. Because Jesus is calling us to be better. There's a lot of noisy gongs out there right now. There's a lot of noisy gongs out there right now. And our message, this this kindness message, this love message is a message of grace for everyone. And that's the thing, that's the sharedness that brings us together, that God loves us all. 
And if we enter into relationships believing that God loves me and doesn't love you, we can't build that bridge. But God loves us all. This message connects with part of my COVID story that I wanted to share a little bit of as our last story for today. Part of our COVID story is we were on spring break uh, Huntsville State Park, enjoying a spring break away with the family, began hearing more of the news. You remember when the news seemed to change. All of us has that one news story. We're like, oh, this is for real now. Uh, for me, I think it had something to do with the NBA had canceled a game. And I went, oh, NBA's canceling games. This is, this is something. We, we packed up at the end of our week. We drove back to the house. And the pop-up camper that we had remained in the driveway uh, so that I could go out there and clean it out. Not long after that, we realized that we would be staying in our house for quite some time, and I needed a place to work. I needed a, an office. And so I looked out in the driveway, and I said, maybe that'll work. And then I opened up that pop-up camper, and the pop-up camper became my church office uh, for several months. And it was hard for pastors. It was hard for all of us, but... For, for someone who wants to connect and help heal and help bring together and bring a word, it became really hard to figure out how is it that I can connect with this congregation that I love so much. And so I got my phone and I started a children's moment. And we did a children's moment every day uh, so that all the children would gather around their parents' iPads and screens. Uh, we called it Children's Time with Pastor Allen. And, 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 it, and it, was, it was a way to connect with the, the children. And it was part Mr. Rogers, and it was part Reading Rainbow, because we read a story together. It was part Weird Al Yankovic, because it had this uh, public access television quality to it, and it was kind of goofy and fun. And it also had this part of like a pastor that's stuck in a pop-up camper out in his front of his house. And we met with the children, and we thought, what is the one thing that I want these children to know as they're going through this time where they have no idea what's going on? Why aren't they going to school? Why do they have to stay at their house? And what we circled on was the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. And over and over again, we told the children, I told the children, I said, hey, be patient and be kind. Be patient and be kind. And we began and we and ended each of those uh, children's shows with be patient and be kind. And it ended up in the theme song, that there was a theme song, and uh, it got a little out of hand. But it was beautiful. Um, children's Time with Pastor Allen. If you want to Google it, you can oh, knock yourself out. You just love watching all those What I began to realize as the children went back to school and we continued this show, we pre-recorded it at some point so that it wasn't live every day, and uh, we began to realize that uh, I had lost my audience of children because they had gone to, uh, to school, but I was gaining all these church members that, that logged in just to watch this show, and uh, so then I stopped it. <laughs> um, Be patient and be kind. Maybe that's still a message that we need to hear today. To boil it all down to what we're called to do, uh, be patient and be kind. And we're told in 1 Corinthians that love is both of those. And we love because of who we are. And we love because God loved us first. And we, we don't love because someone else did something 
to deserve it. We're called to love no matter what, just as God loves us no matter what. So be patient, be kind, love each other. So maybe you and I have a message for our neighborhoods. Maybe you and I have a message for those of us engaged in social media. Maybe we continue our Micah 6-8 challenge where once a day your phone alarm goes off and it reminds you of Micah 6-8 to do justice and to love this kindness and to walk humbly. We have another one for you today, and that is to grab a sign. And so we have these signs. Cam I'm campaigning for kindness. You know, maybe just put it in your yard. Don't point it at your, like, the neighbor that you think needs to read it the most. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Uh, the ushers are going to have the signs at the end of the service. And if you're going to put it in your yard, grab a sign. If you're not going to put it in your yard, we only have 100 of them this morning. So, so hang on to it. If we get low today, we have a sign-up sheet. We're going to order more. We'll have them here next Sunday. It's all going to be good. I kind of want Lisa to have to order some more at the end of the day. Um, but maybe this can be a reminder uh, for our neighbors. Maybe this can be something where we remind ourselves of who we are and who we're called to be. That God's call for us for unity is much, much more than who we vote for in our politics. Maybe this is a time, as Abraham Lincoln did, to call this country back together, and maybe that starts with you and me. I want to close today going back to this book that we've been referencing uh, over the last few weeks. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. Um, I'm going to close with uh, what was a post um, from these uh, two authors that was posted uh, the Wednesday after the 2016 election. So it was posted November Sixth, no, well, you guys get it. Yeah, the day after the election. Maybe this can just be a, more of a reminder for us and an encouragement on who you and I will be over the next 50 days and who will be going forward. Elections are important. This election is important. Our political ideas and affiliations are important. How we vote is important. But none of these things are singularly important. They're important pieces of a much larger, richer puzzles. It's important to see those puzzles in their entirety and to intentionally focus on the bigger picture, even and especially as the smaller picture is coming into resolution. Tuesday is important, but there will be a Wednesday. And Wednesday will be important, perhaps more important than Tuesday in many ways. To prepare for Wednesday, we might decide ahead of time to keep some important truths in mind. America is bigger than one election. America is more than its president control of its Congress and its judiciary. Democracy is an agreement that we're all responsible for implementing. Democracy is a fire we're all responsible for tending. Skipping to the end. People are complicated. People are more than our candidates of choice. People are more than our ideologies. People believe things for reasons we might not fully understand. Voting is the easiest exercise of our civic duty. The real work is in paying attention and caring and communicating and finding the best way to contribute from where we are. We can be the change we want to see in the world. And that's true no matter who wins. There will be a Wednesday, and we can choose to make Wednesday a day that we can be proud of. 
So friends, join us in campaigning for kindness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.